Thank you for tuning in to Fairwinds Energy Education's audio update with our Chief Engineer, Arnie Gunderson. I'm Maggie Gunderson, President and Founder of Fairwinds Energy Education. I'd like to take a quick moment to express my appreciation to each of you for your continuous support and viewership. Your donations are vital as we continue to speak truth to power and expose the nuclear industry's hidden safety risks. So once again, thank you and enjoy this audio update. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson, Chief Engineer for Fairwinds Energy Education. What really happened to the Fukushima Daiichi reactors when TEPCO added ocean salt water to cool them? Fairwinds recently received this question and important technical comments from several viewers and engineers regarding utility owner Tokyo Electric Power Company's use of salt water to cool the Fukushima Daiichi reactors during their triple meltdowns. As we continue looking at the aging operating atomic reactors around the world, it's important to understand this issue and know what may go wrong at other sites. First, let, let's start at the beginning. Because all the cooling pumps were immediately destroyed by the tsunami, when the meltdowns began, there was no clean fresh water available to cool the nuclear reactor cores. Personnel at TEPCO's Daiichi Atomic Site realized in this dire emergency, the only way to cool its atomic reactor was with salt water from the nearby ocean. While TEPCO's Tokyo-based engineers opposed the use of salt water, the only alternative available tool to on-site personnel was to inject salt water into the core of the atomic reactors in a last-ditch effort to slow the meltdowns. Why were the engineers in TEPCO's home office so opposed to the use of salt water to cool the atomic reactors? As anyone who's ever lived by the sea or been on an ocean-going boat knows, salt water makes steel rust. Atomic reactor vessels are made of steel, and hot atomic steel in salt water can equal catastrophe. This phenomenon is called intergranular stress corrosion cracking, or IGSCC. If you took chemistry, you might remember that salt is made up of sodium and chloride. It was the chloride ion that is very aggressive and viciously attacks steel. When I was a new engineer back in 1972, I worked on Connecticut's Millstone Nuclear One atomic reactor, which was a BWR or a boiling water reactor, just like the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Millstone Unit One had blown a pipe in its condenser, allowing salt water to enter the atomic reactor. In less than 15 seconds, the chloride concentration reached 15 parts per million inside the reactor, causing all the stainless steel neutron monitors to crack and fail, leaving the plant staff with absolutely no idea what power level the reactor was operating at. The subsequent shutdown, which the nuke industry calls an outage, lasted almost one year, during which most of the stainless steel piping associated with the reactor had to be replaced. During this serious reactor event, in which vital reactor safety systems were compromised in only 15 seconds, I received my first lesson in nuke speak and the nuclear industry's effort to manage messages delivered to both the federal regulators and to the public. In my report, I called this major mishap a, quote, serious saltwater leak. But my boss changed my wording to call this mishap, quote, a saltwater intrusion. Japan's Samoa plant, also a BWR like Fukushima Daiichi, had saltwater cause irreversible damage when it leaked into the atomic reactor in 2011. At both Hamoaka and Millstone atomic powered reactors, only a very small amount of chloride ion reached the atomic reactor core, and yet it caused enormous damage. TEPCO engineers knew that the chloride ion in salt is fundamentally incompatible with stainless steel, and that the nuclear reactor would crack. However, with a man-made crisis and subsequent meltdowns in process, 
a crack already in the atomic reactor and no other alternative available, TEPCO employees at Fukushima Daiichi injected salt water directly into the reactor's nuclear core. After the salt water was injected, four forces were at play. First, the salt water immediately helped to cool the atomic meltdown. And while cooling down the meltdown was critical, the other three results were terrible. When the salt water was injected, the chloride ion from the salt viciously attacked the nuclear fuel, the internal structures inside the reactor, and the walls of the reactor. So, if the meltdown itself did not destroy the atomic reactor, then the salt water exacerbated that process, causing the reactor to crack anyway. Additionally, so much salt water was injected that the cooling channels began to plug as the water boiled off, leaving only salt behind. And finally, hot salt water and the atomic core, which had melted through the reactor, aggressively attacked the concrete underneath the atomic reactor. This means that the containment failed entirely and that the reactor core, often called corium, destroyed the containment system with its molten lava-like state. I'd like to be clear that the workers at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi plant took the only action they could take with the only tools they had available in their attempt to mitigate this tragic situation. But in solving one problem, three other problems were created. Using salt water compared to the use of pure water to cool the reactor, the staff increased the magnitude of the destruction inside the reactor, increased how quickly the reactor melted down, and created a chemical attack on the concrete containment outside the reactor vessel. Perhaps a hundred years from now, when Fukushima Daiichi's atomic reactors are finally able to be fully dismantled, we will understand exactly how severe the saltwater attack was on each stainless steel reactor and the concrete barriers that were designed to prevent radioactivity from leaking into the atmosphere and groundwater. What the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown makes clear is that these aging atomic reactors are not designed to survive what the nuclear industry calls a maximum credible catastrophe. I'd like to close by thanking you, our viewers and our listeners, for your incredible support and emails this year. If you can, we'd sure appreciate a year-end donation so we can continue this effort into 2016. I'm Arnie Gunderson. We'll keep you informed.